Hey everyone, I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and welcome back to Build. Our next guests are the creators of the iconic HBO comedy series, High Maintenance, which follows the guy, a marijuana dealer, who takes us into the homes and interior lives of New Yorkers. It's a show with so much heart that explores some of the most complicated human emotions and everyday life in New York City. Please help me welcome Ben Sinclair and Katya Blickfeld. <laughs> I like how you guys looked at each other when I said iconic. You said iconic. Yeah. That's a big thing. That's this big show thing. is iconic, I think. Oh, well, that's very nice. I mean, I, I've been a fan <laughs> since the web series. I've lived in New York City for 10 years. Um, and I think it's sort of a common feeling that this show uh, feels like New York, where it's at now, which is kind of a lot of shows try to capture that, and they fail. Um, and something about the magic that you guys do, you guys are able to do it every week. So that's Thank why you. I love it so much. Thank you. Um, for those who haven't seen the show, um, how do you describe it? You go for it. No, you go for it. I don't want to do it. Well, I think we like to describe it as a, a series of character portraits. Well, we used to say it's a series of character portraits that are linked by the presence of one guy, played by Ben Sinclair, uh, who is a marijuana dealer. Uh, has, has that description evolved a little bit? Maybe. Now, you know, it, there's some episodes that are a little more plot-driven than just being like, day in the life or character portrait. But yeah, it's an anthology series. So every episode follows a different household or a different character. And I love uh, when people are like, well, I don't smoke weed, I won't get it. And you're like, no, it's a, it's a character study. That's it's about a, people. It's a real barrier to entry for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yes, still, still, even after all this time, <laughs> which surprises me. Yeah, there are some outlets who are like, oh, we can't interview uh, people from that show because it's of the subject matter. Wow. Meanwhile, Game of Thrones is like a raposphere or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, no, weed is too much. So whatever, that's the world we're living in, I yeah. guess. But I always make the point to tell people it's just, it's a way to get in the door. I mean, like you said, it's what connects all the little vignettes, but it is very much uh, going into people's minds and just all the complicated things that exist within us. Um, casting is such a huge part of this show. Um, I know that's where your background is and something that you, you really are passionate about. Um, I'm interested, what comes first, the role or the actor? Because... Sometimes it feels like the actor was made for that role. Well, because often they were. Okay. Yeah, we how we first started making the show was uh, actor first. Okay. That that was our biggest resource that we had access to in the early days when we made the web series and we didn't have any money. We did know a lot of really amazing actors uh, between the two of us and from me coming from casting and our other executive producer was a talent manager, Russell Gregory. So we, we just had access and we were able to write roles that were customized for some really great people. And I mean, we still do that from time to time and the results are always a little better, I think, when you know who you're writing for. But obviously, you know, when, now that we're having to write these on demand, it's, it doesn't quite work out that way all the time. So, you know, now we rely on our great casting director to find people for us. But in episode one, you have Larry Owens, who I actually saw in a comedy showcase that my friend was in, and he was just larger than life and has this brand of comedy that I feel like a lot of people don't get. It's so distinct. And when I saw him in the show, I was like, oh, this role was like written for him. Was that the Feels case? that way. Yeah, or was that just... It was. That's not the case. No. The Siri, uh, Larry plays uh, Arnold, the singing telegram uh, tel uh, performer. And uh, we had collected those observations from Russell Gregory, our executive producer's experience as a singing telegrammer in Florida in like the 80s. So... 90s. 90s. <laughs> so we uh, kind of found Larry after already mapping out the journey of that character, which is really a journey about uh, having a bad day and then taking a poop and then it's not a bad day anymore. And then I just had it. Uh, and uh, I, <laughs> that just happened to me. I'm just saying what I meant. Uh, and then uh, that kind of all kind of, that came together uh, they had seen Larry perform because Larry. Wonder been if it was the same showcase at Carolines. <laughs> it was at Carolines. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. K Katya uh, attends a lot of live uh, performance, and so she had seen Larry. I saw Larry in Strange Loop, wow. 
And at the end of the day, you know, we didn't. I I didn't really want to show a poop on camera, but I did want. I didn't want to see one. No one wanted to see it. Uh, That's another thing that that other outlets don't want to cover, but Build will do. Uh, So we eventually. We'll talk about anything here. (laughs) Uh, So we uh, so we ended. uh, We wanted to see a song and dance, and when we saw Strange Loop and saw how Larry moves around the stage in that wonderful show. Uh, that was a very solid bet. Yeah. <laughs> and then you made that one of the most beautiful poops I've ever seen uh, on television. Did you hear that today's <laughs> show? Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, one reason I do call this show iconic is because of all of the actors and comedians you kind of introduced and have introduced to us over the years. And I know it kind of started for Ben, this was a way for Ben to get a role that he felt that he could really grow and breathe in. So is it cool for you guys to give that opportunity to so many people? Because so many of these actors have gone on to have really big careers now. Yes, it is so cool. That's the whole reason I got into this business in the first place is because I love actors and I like to, you know, shine a light on what people do really well. Ben is my... I would argue one of my bigger success stories in that realm, I think. And he's, you know, grown the guy into something that I don't know that we ever could have initially conceived of. But, yeah, I think Helena York is another one of our big success stories. She's on the other two, and she's brilliant. Um, But, yeah, we like to cast the the people from the alt-comedy scene, the Kat Cohens and the Larry Owens and the Ruby McAllister, and there's uh, others coming. Yes. When it comes to the guy, will we ever find out what his name is? I don't know. You should keep watching. Uh, the, we really uh, like to <laughs> we really like to tease that one. Yeah, I think uh, we just the, the 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 strongest thing about this show is the format. Yeah. So the guy, uh, when we were first conceiving of this character, we did give him backstories and played with the name and et cetera, et cetera. And then we're like, no, 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 no. It's not about him. It's about all of the people that this person meets and having as much knowledge about this dealer as people who are buying weed have about their dealers, which is nothing, usually. So uh, the personality of the guy we have always teased out uh, as... uh, like, um, does the audience want to see this? Like, if they want it, should we withhold it a little more to keep them watching? And then uh, last season, season three on HBO, was a lot of, uh, not extremely revelatory of his character, but there was certainly more stuff about him there. This season, we pull back, and we go back to the, sh- the short stories of the people who buy from the guy. But there is bits and pieces in there. It's mostly his behavior that you're gleaning his, his life story from. It's not I- exposition. Yeah. And um, how much of Ben is in him? Because like when my cousin came to New York City, she was looking for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like she just has it wrapped up that like that's who you are. She's like, I just wanna like just say hi to him. So does that happen a lot? And how much do people kind of confuse you with with the guy? Uh, it's it's interesting. I think if I was just cast as the guy and I uh, and Katya and Ben were different people yeah. than me, uh, I think that uh, it would I would be maybe a little frustrated by that or a little felt misunderstood. But because uh, the guy is... Um, because this show is a kind of a journal in some ways, it's kind of a log in some ways, it's the thoughts and feelings of Katya and I and Russell and all of the writers that come into the room and all of the producers. Because it's an amalgamation of the efforts of this community that we formed around this project, I feel very proud that people want to interact with this person. I feel extremely open to that idea of being more li- being like the guy. I would say, I am uh, uh, that he is the collection of all of our best intentions on in our little community. And yeah, he's who we aspire to be, and has sort of the the mindset and the approach to life that we all have had at our best moments, and want to keep having that curiosity, the openness, the non judgmental attitude, and yeah. So now we're all sort of collectively just trying to keep that going. What is that um, process like in the writer's room? Is it people just all pulling from their personal experiences? 
like how do you guys narrow it down? These stories always seem so personal and intricate. They are really personal. We I, every day in the writers' room, and I mean, I don't know what it's like in other writers' rooms because I've only been in this one. But we just we're just telling stories all day. We just sit around. We go around the table and. Like, you know, Monday morning is like, what'd you do this weekend? And it's like hours of talking and people telling stories and getting pretty personal. Oh, yeah. Lorelai Ramirez uh, wrote on our show this year. They're a comedian. They're doing Another great oh, oddball yeah. comedian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As well, yeah. And uh, I ran into them at a party recently. And they've been in a couple of other writers' rooms since ours. And they're like, nobody talks as... In, in their experience, as deeply about really, act, we talk about hard stuff in the room. There are often days I've there's walked tears. Out, there's tears. I've walked out of, out of there feeling completely floored because uh, we, uh, I won't, we don't have to talk about it too much, but there's an article in the New York Times Magazine a couple weeks ago written by Willie Staley about. The, uh, the the fantasy New York that is depicted in shows like High Maintenance and Russian Doll and uh, Aziz and it is a it's a tough article because it's it's full of paradox and it's full of contradiction and we talk about paradox and contradiction in our in our room a lot of uh, wanting things to be one way but things are another way and wanting two things at the same time and I think. Uh, Ultimately, life would be easier for all of us if we could uh, be okay with contradiction and paradox. But it's actually really hard. It's kind of uh, uh, it. It doesn't settle well with yeah. most of us. I read that article, and I think it ended with the the line of like, you get in the subway, you go home, you order seamless, you watch Netflix, and it's like you're alone, even though you're in this big city where it's like so romanticized in our art so often. And that's something I think you guys really uh, explore so well is the kind of isolation that can happen in the city and how people are always seeking connection and how difficult that can be. Um, and that's sort of been a theme in the show since the beginning. So why is that something that you keep rehashing or exploring? Because we keep feeling it, I think. Yeah, no matter how big our communities get, no matter, I mean, I've lived in the city now 16 years, I think, and I don't think a day goes by that I like go out into the world and don't run into people I know. So it's like, it started to feel like a bit of a small town mm -hmm to me and yet you know and and I and I've also like had the good fortune to have a, a six romantically successful life like have partners that I live you know this and that and still like in your darkest moments you can still something about the proximity to so many people I mean I'm saying a total cliche but it's just true something about that feeling of having all this energy and life and people around you and feeling loneliness in juxtaposition to that. It's just a very particular brand of, of loneliness. It really, it, it just cuts you a little deeper or something when you can see all this other like life going on outside your window or on the subway. I think it has to do with the desensitization or the overstimulation. And because there are you know, so many people around us, we have to put on walls in order to get from, from point A to point B without like giving all of our money away in the, in the meantime. Yeah, or if you're really sensitive to not like absorb all exactly. like people's negative but, emotions. But you put those walls up and then they're up, yeah. you know? And I think a lot of people are talking about the power of vulnerability and how, uh, you know, I notice in more, uh, in smaller cities, people are like, hey, how you doing? And then they'll hang out for an answer and you're like, whoa. Uh, yeah, what's going on here? What do they want from me? Yes, exactly. But I think also the the weed smoking and like the act of actually doing it and then us portraying it too, like part of that is um, trying to tear down some of the walls and become a little bit more open and vulnerable. I think it like sometimes smoking, it's people smoke for all kinds of reasons, but I think that is one reason some of us smoke is to feel a little more vulnerable. Yeah, for sure. And I it do. can help people connect to um, the second episode I love so much, might be one of my new favorites, um, because we're in this culture where everybody's owning their sexuality and we're so proud and we don't talk about people who identify as asexual very often and what that experience is like. And the way you guys sort of just like took us on that ride with discovering intimacy, I thought was so beautiful. And you brought back a character that a lot of us probably you know, we're curious about how his story ended. Um, what is the process of bringing back a character like that and continuing on their story? Is that something you had in mind in the beginning or is it something that it just, in a pitch meeting, you're like, we need to bring him back? 
Well, first I have to give a shout out to Isaac Oliver yeah. who wrote that episode. And to you who directed it. Oh, that well, was a you. really tremendous thank episode. You. Thank you. Uh, Isaac Oliver is a, a local writer, humorist, and he's on our writing staff. And he wrote a book called Intimacy Idiot. It's a topic that he really is... <laughs> Is, is delving into daily. So I think we, and we've had him in our room now for three seasons. So I think we are turning to him for that theme a lot. But we all, like, we all really liked a Avery Monson is the actor who plays Evan. Ben and him went to college together, fun fact. We lived together for three years, uh, two years in college and one year out. Yeah. So we always knew we wanted to bring him back. He's such a good actor. Did he really do magic? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can't fake that. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> a lot of the specialty... There, we'll we'll have a character that performs. A, there's a puppeteer later in the in the season, and you gotta hire a puppeteer. You can't <laughs> yeah. fake that stuff, you know. So Avery, but just on his own, is an extremely talented, extremely sympathetic person, and uh, it, it 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 really warms my heart to see him over the years. Like this is the best acting I've ever seen from him and I've seen him in scene study classes and all sorts of shit uh, uh, from like f it, it is so lovely to see his vulnerability there we used to like joke how we couldn't cry like him and I used to like try to make each try and make ourselves cry in acting class and we would like really be like <gasps> like really try to try to squeeze out tears and uh, he, it's it was nice to see him get there got there it's it's so yeah i can't wait for more people to see it and be like did you see that episode because again we're talking about isolation and whatnot but it's also when you find somebody to connect to how beautiful that is and that's kind of what we're all looking for at some level um i also love how you guys sort of balance bringing in recognizable actors really big names you typically have them play themselves or actors what is the balance in that in in kind of maintaining the tone of the show with bringing in bigger recognizable people. I mean, it's a it's a tricky little dance because sometimes people who are recognizable don't play themselves, and I'm like, what is our logic here? Uh, I think we always didn't. We've always endeavored to cast unknowns because we just think it helps you lose yourself a little bit more as a viewer. Being you know, you're not distracted by whatever you might know about that performer. So we, we've been more we've been more in pursuit of the up and comers always. And then sometimes well-known people reach out or become our friends in, in real life and then express interest in doing the show. And then of course we're thinking about like how could we incorporate them and use them to the best of their abilities while without compromising you know, the reality that we are trying to portray. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not, there's no science. It's just sort of an intuitive thing, I guess. And uh, I think one of the favorite cast members is going to be the dog. <laughs> FOMO, the little tweet. Chloe. Yeah, the dog's Chloe. name is Chloe. Can we talk about Chloe? Like, what it, do you want to talk is about? Is Chloe a, a, like a dog friend of yours or is that an actor dog? Now. <laughs> you know what? Chloe's from Florida. <laughs> Chloe got flown in every time we needed Chloe. Yeah. Chloe is also like the Betty White of dog actors, apparently 14, and we yeah. didn't know it the whole we were time. Told, we were told Chloe was 10. <laughs> and then I heard Chloe was 14, and then I saw Chloe like getting off the couch, and I'm like, Keep her on the couch. <laughs> yeah. We don't need this dog getting she all pooped She looks so down. spry. In the, I know. In the though. She's like jumping around the bike. She's I would very. The dog is 30 pounds. I fa uh, that, that, do <laughs> that dog is a 30 Good thing you've been working That's out. A, well, it was on my back for a while. You but, were cycling with the yes, 30 Yes, of pounds. course. But okay. Chloe was really good. Chloe was really good on the rehearsal. Always nailed the rehearsal. And then we'd start shooting. And then, like, Chloe had two takes <laughs> after that. But... But she would get it, and then it was over. Dogs are motivated by food. I don't know if dog, you know this. Dogs can't act. Dogs no. can't act. <laughs> they really uh, can't. They're not human. But we beings. have really great. Yeah, we have this guy Bill Berloni that we work with, and he has Wonderful. trainers that come in. And we've had an episode in season one on the HBO edition uh, called Gats Grandpa, uh, where we had a. That was our first time working with him, and we had a really positive experience. And so ever since then. We've never since that time we've never shied away from scripting animals in our in our show because we know that we're just gonna call Bill and he will deliver even a cockroach. <laughs> like honestly, they there's trainers for the cockroaches. I will say that this season, uh, whereas last season was about death, 
this season was more about reincarnation and reusing stuff. The first episode is a lot about reuse and recycling. And I think we did take a lot of our themes and characters from the past. We took a dog, which was enormously successful in season one. We took Avery Monson, who played the Ace, and many other characters who we've used before. And also... Uh, like other kind of plot lines and twists and even that we've used before. And we kind of did them the same, but a little different. Yeah. And that, uh, to have the longevity to be able to use something, get away from it, and then use it again is been really cool because it's like this, it's, it's this uh, cycle we're going in, but we, it's a spiral shaped cycle that we have a different vantage point every time we come around again. Yeah. And that's been nice. And for fans who have been, you know, on, on board since the web series. It is so cool to see those little things. And I love that you two, as a creative partners, you were married, you were divorced, you've continued this show going. Why was it important for you to, to continue the show? I almost see it as like, I just watched the marriage story. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> like, this is your baby. And it's like, we gotta put the baby first. That's a priority. Why was that so important for you to just keep it going? I mean, it, that's, it's like, uh, it's our, it was our kid. I don't know. It was really that show is deeply important to us. It's definitely the thing that made our careers, arguably, and we've made so many like really true, deep friends who are now like family because of it. It would just have been so uh, even more devastating, heartbreaking to blow it up along with the relationship. And I think like we've always said, like it going on and working on season two after we had just split felt like some sort of exposure therapy or something. So we couldn't like hulk out like Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson every day like we were having to come be professional in a writer's room with w people around us who were like there to work for us and had to keep it together like and Mark Ruffalo was the Hulk but you're talking about a different <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh yeah I th I think it's uh it just because something ends it why would that mean it wasn't a success you know, I feel like we should extend marriage to marriage, the institution of marriage, the courtesy of allowing it to end successfully instead of saying, oh, you didn't last forever. Ah, you failed. That's crazy. That's crazy. All, a lot of great things end. Yeah. I feel like I have that conversation with my friends all the time. So I'm right on the same page. Um, who has our first question? Kiani? Hi. Um, so... Over the seasons, we've met so many characters with such interesting and unique lives. Um, I was wondering if you guys had a favorite character or maybe, so you said you based a lot of them off of your actors, but if there were any that you created that were unfortunately left in the writer's room that you might want to explore later. It's so hard when you have an anthology series because there's like actually hundreds of characters now. So I'm like, who do we love? It's all of them. Uh, in this uh, week's episode, there's a character named Evan Waxman. Originally, he had a roommate named Troy, who was uh, his other, he was his, was Troy an asexual roommate? Yeah, they it were was both asexuals. Yeah, they were both asexual. Both asexual magicians living together. We really wanted to cast Nathan Th Fielder as Troy because he kind of looks like Avery as well. He kind of looks like, so they were they to have be a similar vibe. Yes, yeah. they were to be doppelgangers. And I miss Troy. I wish I met Troy, uh, but but he was a little more he was a little more downtrodden and a little meaner than him. Uh, oh God, that's a good question. Uh, I feel like we bring back so many, like anyone we like, even people who were like in a tiny role, like there was that guy that like was a food delivery guy with like two lines in season two and then he came back like as like a mixed martial arts guy or whatever this season, didn't he? Like I just feel like when we like, did you not realize that? Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I didn't realize well, we, he was we, the food delivery yeah, guy. Yeah, we really like, I think we just wow. keep responding to certain people so and there are people who are on this season who like had two lines another season and now they have like a full storyline like um crystal monet hall like she had she was just funny and like two lines in season two and now she has like a full story so we like we like to do that we, we bring back all the people we like if I've you've been, seen them more than once it's because we like them i've been trying to put a parrot in for a couple years now no one's letting me put a parrot in we found a parrot on the street when i was a young child and we kept it for years yeah, it was an African gray parrot. It talked all the time. What did it say? It said everything. It said anything we would say. Answering machine messages a lot of times. 
back in the days of answering machine. Guys, now I want to pair it. Yes, exactly. I'm just saying now if you're talking about loneliness. Maybe that, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, it's a constant companion. You know, seems like an easy Someone to episode. chat with. Yeah. Um, what is the episode or character that people come up to you the most about? I have heard the most about uh, Dan Stevens's character. Well, there's a few, but that one to me, people mention a lot. He plays a character named Colin, who's a cross-dressing stay-at-home dad. I've had so many DMs from strangers all around the world telling me that was an episode that helped them uh, get in touch with what they wanted their gender expression to be. I've had my own therapist. <laughs> Actually, funny story, I, I started to see a new therapist this year and I didn't tell her what I did for a living for the first multiple sessions. And then one day I was sort of describing my day and she's, and she's like, what do you do? And I was like, I make a, I make a TV show. And I didn't want to say what it was for some reason. I don't know. I just kind of vaguely beat around the bush and she was like, do you make high maintenance? And I was like, yeah. And then she fanned out, which was kind of funny. <laughs> she was just like, oh my God, I'm sorry. Uh, I love the show. But I, the, the episode with the cross-dressing dad, I've actually had a lot of clients that I've, that I've, shared that episode with and it was like a tool for them uh to to like start a broach a conversation with loved ones and i don't know so when you hear that sort of a thing it feels really good yeah i think surprising acts of kindness are the things that people respond most about the show whenever we are able to hit the sweet spot of like oh i didn't know that i had that prejudice in me and then I watch something happen where somebody's kinder to somebody than we think they would be because of the prejudice we have about them. Uh, that's that's always or a the fulfilling. cynicism or the cynicism. <laughs> yeah, that's always a very nice feeling. It's more more than characters. It's uh, turns of characters. That's really powerful. Well, people can change yeah. too. I think we like to show that as well, that people can grow and change, and yeah. people can exceed your expectations. A lot of times, we like to tell the story of man in a hole or a person in a hole where like somebody starts out, they're trying to make a change in their life and then everything gets spins out of control a little bit and they're like, oh, why did I, they get themselves into a mess and they get back to where they started, but a little bit better. They just learned one small thing on that little journey and that's always a very nice uh, kind of recollection that life goes on and we're getting a little bit better every time we mess up. Just as a fan, I just can I still can't get over Homeless Heidi. Oh. oh yeah, Greta still Lee. Love Greta Lee and Homeless Heidi. Still cannot get over that. Didn't see it coming. One of the best like ten minutes I've ever watched on TV. Yeah, I'm proud of that one. That was a really early one and super early. That was yeah, the web series. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just recently rewatched it. I was like, God, it's and it holds up. up. Oh, thank it holds you. Holds up. Yeah, it's a relief. And Michael, back there. Hi. Uh, so, if you were viewers of the show and weren't involved in creating the show. Uh, what would keep you coming back and watching? I would, there's, uh, you never know what you're going to be watching every episode. You have no idea if it's going to be a comedy or a drama or who this person is going to be. We really play with expectation a lot. And because uh, once you watch a couple of episodes, you understand that uh, it's always going to be different. There is... Um, I would imagine an anticipation, the, an enjoyment of the anticipation of who's behind this door. Uh, I think that would be what brought me back, is just the anticipation of who's next. How about you? Same? Yes, yeah, same. And also just, I, w I think, feeling, uh, feeling not judged. I think we really try hard uh, and hopefully are succeeding most of the time in uh, not having a judge, not not portraying people with a judgment. Even if they're kind of despicable, we're still looking for what what else about this person makes them who they are, trying not to reduce people to just like cliches and stereotypes. I think that is something I would enjoy as a viewer, feeling feeling like these characters are complex and feeling kind of seen and, and hopefully feeling like I'm okay. <laughs> like when I walk away, like, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. Yeah. I mean, when you watch this show and then you get on the subway and you see all the people and you just imagine all the things that are going on in all these people's lives. Everyone has a story. It's empathy, really. Mm -hmm. and it's just, it, it just encourages you to have empathy for other people and for yourself. And There's a word for that. It's called Sonder, S-O-N-D-E-R. It's the, it's the realization that people have their own stories to their own lives and it's not just you alone in the world. Right. 
yeah. preach, and this show encompasses that. Uh, so great chatting with you guys. You too. Thank, Thank you. Continued success. You. you guys can watch new episodes of High Maintenance. They drop every Friday on HBO. Put your hands together for Katya and Ben. Thank you. Thank you.